Okay, uh, for those that just heard Bill Pinnell's presentation, this hopefully will not have nearly the technical depth. And I just say that, um, I just find as I go further in my career, um, I love technical stuff. I read it on the internet like every day of my life. It's like I got like seven or eight different websites I click on every day. I come to a talk here and my ADD gets in. And all of a sudden it's like I get data overwhelmed on kilowatt hours and energy hours. And that's sort of been a focus for us of, you know, we've got what I consider like really smart people. I mean, we design rockets. I mean, we design space exploration architectures. I worked for Bill Pinnell, you know, when he was at NASA. And yet, I don't understand energy. And it's like, and I got a degree in physics. I got a degree in physics, mathematics, and aerospace engineering, and I don't understand our energy system. And I'm like, and if I don't understand it, I try to explain it to my wife, Angel, who has an English degree, and holy cow. No, no, that, the translation just didn't even occur. So, Zero Point Frontiers, like our motto basically is you, everything starts at zero. And our goal is to basically try to create clarity from complexity. Um, let's see. So, what is a zero point? Um, so, in physics, uh, which is my first love, uh, zero point, actually, the name was derived from the fact we have zero point energy. And for those that don't know what zero point energy is, uh, watch Stargate. Um, it's a great sci fi show. But fundamentally, um, we used to think it, um, energy relates to temperature. We used to think in the physics and science community that when you brought the temperature of the universe to zero, that energy would equal zero. And so a lot of equations, a lot of curves, a lot of theory was derived on this. When we actually were able to super chill atoms and liquid helium and bring things colder and colder and colder, all of a sudden the experimental data pointed to a positive intercept. So kinetic energy in the universe was actually non-zero, which means zero point energy which means the sum total of the available energy of the universe is infinite. Now, unfortunately for us, uh, we don't have the physics knowledge to be able to tap into such a thing, which is why it's left to the realm of science fiction at this point. But the bottom line is, sum total of the energy of the universe, you know, created, destroyed, but that's the theoretical concept. <laughs> Engineering also has a zero point, which is one of our names. We used to do a lot of work on, like, there's a, program called JSF, um, military space planning and things. I used to work integrated designs, and anybody worked with giant integrated design, and you ever sat in a room with uh, your design engineers, and you're trying to integrate a CATIA platform with solid words with things. The first thing that happened, I was on a Tiger team, and with Northrop as we were partnering with Lockheed, and we were integrating unigraphics pad systems with CATIA about 10 or 12 years ago. Um, we spent like 50 to 100 million dollars rewriting every part because the zero points of the two systems were wrong. And the zero point whenever you're doing a complex design solution, if you have your origin of your CAD system placed in the wrong place from another one, you, anybody that's worked that, you are opposed. You are opposed and you will redraw everything. So for us in engineering, how do you know if you're gonna push a solution forward? Well, if you don't know where your origin is, you have no idea if you're actually pushing a solution forward. And that's sort of philosophically how we drive every problem that we work at at the company. So, um, so we're a small business, um, and we believe we have, like, uh, we bring in people who I call from, you know, prime contracting backgrounds or large company backgrounds, but I've also worked for guys like Tim Pickens, and you, you learn really quickly how in a small business to basically shed every bureaucratic layer and try to think of things from a completely different approach. Um, we're at Lincoln Mill. Um, we do a lot of, basically, um, we try to work in an open environment. And so basically our motto is, you know, it's like, um, anybody comes to my building, they always ask me where my office is, and I point to the desk in the corner, just like everybody else's desk. You know, if you're not, you know, you can't tell people to do things in today's environment that you're not willing to do yourself. Um, that's what I'm finding out um, working with basically the Facebook generation. Um, they know more about you than you'll ever know about them, okay? 
they Googled you, they LinkedIn you, they Facebooked you, they've seen your online patterns. If you're interviewing a 20 year old or a 25 year old from the job, believe me, they probably actually know more about you than you will ever figure out about them. So, um, so we love space, we love energy, we love nanotech, biotech, and robotics. And our goal is to start a company and grow that company to fuse those technologies together simultaneously, because that's where really cool stuff happens. How do you do that? Our viewpoint is you start with the fundamentals of system engineering and software development. Everything is migrating into the information space. So right now, most of our work is actually in the space industry. Um, we do a lot of work with commercial space. Um, we develop a lot of software tools for NASA and for ourselves and for commercial companies. Um, one of our goals this year is, you know, everybody's probably heard about 3D printing and additive manufacturing. Um, our goal this year was to examine our design process and fundamentally figure out how to inject that technology into every problem we come across. And so we, we did an exercise this summer on injecting that technology and figuring out world, world design problems. Um, so that was pretty fun. And we also love to develop um, what we call like basically iOS type of applications. So how does it relate to energy? Um, so we've been puzzling over this for actually several years in the company. And our goal right now is we think we need to create better understanding. And when I mean better understanding, it's I don't even actually pay attention to my own power. It's like I'm an engineer, I'm energy conscious, I got friends that build energy custom homes, and yet I don't even understand the trends in my own power goals. And so I go, well, if I don't understand the trends, and I'm pretty bright, and I'm not willing to go type in a bunch of stuff in the database. My guess is I'm about probably where 70 percent of the people are. Um, so currently, we're architecting what we call our utilities app, and the goal for this is essentially to create simplified understanding so that anybody with the basic high school diploma can basically understand their bill. And what we're finding out is um, you can't use kilowatt hours, you can't use energy metrics, because most people actually have no idea what those are. You know, most people read a light bulb and they look at watts, and it's like it's a concept that means nothing because we don't pay our energy bill on energy, and so you got to relate it to dollars, near-term dollars. So everything in our stuff will probably be focused on red, green, and dollars. And those will be your metrics for output on trying to understand your energy bill. So long term, what we're kind of looking is the, like the same thing like the, the gentleman from Raytheon this morning. You know, it's like, how do you affect cultural behavior? Um, there's a lot of cultural behavior that's changing daily now. You know, it's like, uh, I'm, you know, it's like I check Facebook probably, you know, once a day um, now. I want to affect culture. So what we intend on doing is looking how do you crowdsource this data and how do you generate a community that gets interested in their own community energy. And so architecting part of the application will be sort of being able to join a community so that not only do you see how you're doing, you can see how everybody else is doing. And then we're looking at positive feedback features, like maybe you get a cool party or something that you know you, you do when you achieve a goal. So, because I'm always about free stuff. Um, Midterm, uh, we've been working with UAH, and uh, they have a, they brought in a, a pulse platinum fusion device. Uh, so we've been looking at partnering with those guys, and basically, pulse platinum fusion we looked at is, is a good sustainable long-term space energy. And so they brought that experiment down there in the aerophysics lab down in NASA. And so we've been looking at trying to do SDRs with those guys. Uh, we've been partnering with Bill Pinnell's Army Energy Lab, and we're looking at ways that you can take their simulation technologies and how do you optimize it and distribute it into distributable platforms. Um, our long-term goals is to basically, how do you blend hardware and software to really affect behavioral cultural change energy? And most of our energy is actually done in our homes, so for us that means affecting the consumer of those energies directly. Long term, what we want to achieve is a very clear, concise understanding of net zero. Um, 
it's like I've done, we've started doing a lot of research on what net zero means. And that definition floats all over the place right now. And so we take a pride of ownership of having zero in our name. Um, it would be awesome if we could start basically building an understanding so that at your home level, at your office level, at your community level, at an installation level, people actually could understand how, what is the right path? Because you've probably got a million pathways probably got a million trade-offs and you got a million decisions you want to make of is it is smart to go to net zero, maybe the bridge is too far, maybe 80% solution is good, but basically what we want to do is create the holistic framework so that basically everybody can know when you get to net zero. So those are our short-term, mid-term, and long-term goals. So thank you.
absorbs the heat into a go to the refrigeration cycle, take that heat, put it on the condenser side of the centrifugal chiller, flow water through the cooling tower, evaporate off of it, a lot of water to about 2.3 gallons per ton. So if this 1,200 ton machine is running for one hour at full load, we're going to evaporate over 2,400, 2,500 gallons of water. So a lot of water gets wasted. So here's the how efficient, raise that up just a little. So how efficient is a centrifugal chiller? I took a snapshot of some line data on the bottom right, ran through the equations, and I've got a CLP of 3.8. Basically, what, if you convert electricity over the BTUs, so you got BTUs coming in, I'm put, uh, generating BTUs of cold water. So basically, for every BTU of electricity in, I'm getting 3.8 BTUs into the chill water loop. So the, look, that's better than one. The boiler was less than one. This is more than one. So I want to look at the latest thing we've done, and it's kind of exciting. We're using some equipment that's been around for several years, but we're using it in a different fashion. These my heat machines were started up on May 13th. You look at that, and for your facility guys, and mechanical guys, you may have dared to tell that's a screw chiller. We're not using it to make cold water, we're using it to make hot water, thus the term heat machine. The sole, the sole purpose of the heat machine is to make that hot water. So that's the reason we haven't ran the boiler for the last 90 days. So, this snapshot of the building automation system. If you look fairly close, it has a set point right now of like 107 degrees and has a leading water temp 107. Important thing to note, when you make that chiller, we was looking at, it had the cooling tower. The cooling tower loops an open loop because we're evaporating water out. We're going to make that water up. The chill water loop's closed. In theory, we lose no water. We make no water up. Both sides of this machine is a closed loop. So we're not making up water. Our product is hot water on the left. My byproduct's cold water. I'm using every bit of heat and every bit of cooling this machine's generating. So I'm using 100% of my product, 100% of my byproduct. So what does that do for me? Now let's look at the efficiency of them. Go back to the coefficient of performance. Now that I'm using all the BTUs generated on the heating and cooling side, so I'm just basically run through the calculations and sum that up, and now I've got a single feed for the heat machine. Basically 7.1. So all of a sudden, my electricity becomes a big favor. I can get a, generate a million BTUs for $3.55 or whatever that says versus natural gas. It's kind of hard to believe that um, I can take electricity and generate a million BTUs, um, much less than natural gas, which is the tradition. I just happened to be in Charlotte, North Carolina a year or two ago, and saw a guy talk about this application. And they just said, if you can give me a month or two out of the year, I can have this machine pay for itself. Well, we're going to be able to give them eight or nine months out of the year. Because if we reset our hot water based on outside air temps and hot water by position throughout the buildings, we're hoping to keep these machines online for eight or nine months. And when our requirement to have water hotter than 140, we'll go back to the fire tube boilers and keep them online until spring. So in 90 days, they generated over 5 billion BT, just a big number of BTUs, 5 billion BTUs, equates out to about 100. 50,000 more horsepower. I want to make sure I explain this to you because I get excited talking about it because it's exciting to me. <laughs> Our saving rate is at the lowest it possibly can be because I'm only running one machine. I got two and I'm running one. As it cools off outside and my heating requirements are going to go up, I'm going to have both machines running. So savings, instead of savings doing this, savings are going to be doing this. So I'm curious to see how long we can go into the fall and winter before we have to you know, turn these off and go back to natural gas. You can tell by the slope of the lines, only one machine is running on, on that trend there, each data point being a day. And if you sum that up, that's 400,000 tons of cooling. Those other centrifugal children did not have to produce. If, my, if I didn't have that 400,000 tons of byproduct, 
those other centrifugal chillers would have had to produce that 400,000 tons. Snapshot in time, well, let's just go to, everybody wants to talk about money saved. So what has it done for us? $50,000 in savings, documented savings, a million gallons of water. That, you know, that's a lot of water. That's a lot of water we didn't have to put chemicals in to treat before we put into the cooling towers. And that $50,000 does not include that $1,800 for that amount of water. And we do get sewer credit, but we'd still have to pay 20%. We'd have to pay sewer credits on 200,000 gallons of water, which is a significant cost. Uh, and one day we'll find time to add that cost in. So my, my current needs at this snapshot in time, I need 58 more horsepower, and I'm offloaded those other chillers dedicated for chill water by 113 tons. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, eight or nine months we're hoping to get out of these. By running these, our boilers will uh, stay offline for eight or nine months. Our boilers were slightly oversized, over 500 horsepower, and my boiler loads 50 boiler horsepower in the summertime, but if those boilers cycle on and off, you'll be repairing that boiler every two or three years because it kind of grows by an inch every time it cycles on and off. Expected to save in natural gas savings about $200,000 a year. Um, and hopefully at today's rate, we will plan on saving about $4 million. It's a lot of money. Um, so with all that said, I would like to say that you know, all this stuff just doesn't happen. You know, I'd like to thank the guys, the upper administration at UAH, for recognizing you know, the invest in energy. Uh, one milestone, UAH got an energy manager like three and a half years ago. Vanessa Ennis, she's in the room. And to fund that in a time of proration when our budgets were cut 28%, you know, is really speaks volumes of our upper administration. We got Alex back, back in the room. She's a met an intern for uh, Campus Power Save Energy. We got Haley Hicks. She's a coordinator for Chargers for Sustainability. Well, she just got twenty thousand dollars from the vice president of finance for the students to uh, come up with energy ideas and implement those on campus. So we got the upper level support, which it takes, and we're excited about that. And this is a real cheesy shot because it's taking a little. <laughs> Let's see if I can figure. Is there a mouse or something here? Okay. How do I move around? How do I play that big? There right there it is. Anyway, this is just with a little webcam. And man, that's an energy savings calculator. That's in house design. So we document our energy savings. And we had to spread the decimal places out to make it look impressive. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, the, the, the beauty of it is, it's, it's going positive, not negative, like our national debt. <laughs> so, uh, and another thing that's great about energy savings, it's recurring. You know, if I said 10,000 this year on that, it's going to save at least 10,000 next year. Well, that doesn't look all that impressive, but that's. We're saving a, a little bit over a penny a second. Doesn't sound like a whole lot of money, but if you go through the numbers and calculate the seconds in a year, to try to figure out how much we're saving a day, we're saving up to approximately $1,000 a day at UAH, $365,000 a year, and that number grows every time we do a project. So that's all I've got.